So, greetings, everybody. Um, we're mixing it up a little bit today. As you can see, our regular host, Evan Rudder, is finishing a be back tomorrow. So in his absence, you get me and Jenna Goff, of course, who will keep things on the rail while I'm sitting in here. I am, I'm Mike Sutton, class of 76. Uh, many of you knew me as Coach Sutton, and now I'm the Director of Advancement for Athletics and a colleague of Evan and Jenna's on the CMC team. I'm really happy to be able to introduce Jeff Russell, class of 84, for our event today. And please know you see that we're being recording this meeting uh, for our library, so uh, people who can't be with us today can take a look at it a little bit later on. So we here in Claremont hope you and your families and loved ones are managing as well as possible during this incredibly challenging time. And I know there is so much up in the air for all of us to be sure. Um, you probably know the college leadership along with a great team of students have been working around the clock you know, this summer to prepare for the return of students next month. And I'm really impressed with the depth of thought, imagination and determination of these folks. They have got so many variables they're working with right now. And uh, we all hope there's an opportunity for our CMC years to be, together, to be together in 3D, but we'll have a good plan for the fall regardless. Uh, we'll put the link CMC returns in the chat box if you wanna check and see what the plans are to date and how, how thoughtful and thorough they are. I've also heard Evan promote the end of June and fiscal year outreach. And I wanna thank everyone for their support for the crisis response fund and for our alma mater. Uh, Many parents and friends have assisted the college with donations that have enabled us to respond to the needs of our students this spring and summer. And we're very grateful for that generosity. Thank you very much. So on to the program. Uh, it's probably not your first Zoom, but here are a quick review of the features that we have. I expect you all know the difference between speaker and grid view. And so you wanna see who else here, it's the grid. And uh, if you wanna listen to Jeff and get Jeff full view there, you got that on speaker. Um, in the chat box, it would be great if you would add your name, your location, and your class year and parent year and or parent year, and let us know who's here today. Uh, and also, you can add a question for Jeff in there at any time. And then when we get to the Q&A portion a little later, you can raise your hand in the, using the participant feature, and we'll call on you then as well. So I got to know Jeff early in my coaching career uh, back at CMC. I knew him first as a leader on the golf team. And he played for two of my favorite people in CMS coaching history, Larry Corpitz and Grell Hollett, two of the very best. Jeff's senior season was special for many reasons. He was our stag captain. Chris Brandt was a freshman on that team. Uh, and he was our MVP. And uh, he finished, he uh, was honored with the Jesse Clark Memorial Award that year for the second time in his career as the Skyac golfer that all looked up to and somebody they respected and and wanted in there for some. And he finished his second tour at the NCAA championships with a hole in one on the back nine of his final round of collegiate golf. At the CMC awards dinner later, he received the Bill Dickinson award and that, com that combines athletics, leadership and service as a great example, how those of us in athletics hope our stags and Athenas could represent on campus. After leaving CMC, Jeff earned a master's degree in journalism from Northwestern the premier program in the country, of course. Uh, and subsequently, he has made a wonderful life and a huge impact on the development of golf journalism, most recently with the Golf Channel. We were able to reconnect a few years ago when he was inducted into the CMS Athletics Hall of Fame, and I got to meet his great family during that celebration. I've especially appreciated Jeff recently as an excellent mentor and advisor for CMCers who are interested in the path he has taken. And Jeff, thanks for taking all those calls. Mm -hmm. So I'll shut up and let's welcome Jeff Russell, and uh, we'll be back for the Q&A a little later on. Jeff? Hey, Coach Sutton, thanks very much. Those are very kind words. I appreciate it. I, de I deserved about 20% of it, but, I, but I, I appreciate it nonetheless. And it's great to see everybody uh, who showed up here. I see a lot of old friends and a lot of, a lot of new faces, um, but it, this is really great, and it's, it's an honor to be here. Um, you know, as the introduction said, I, I, I have felt, um, and I probably do feel like I, you know, I chose a different path for most CMC grads. Everybody that I went to school with, it seemed like went to law school or, or Wall Street or 
business school, um, you know, I did something maybe a little bit different. Uh, my story, of course, it always begins with golf. Um, I first played golf when I was six years old. And by the time I was 12 years old, uh, golf was all I wanted to do. I wanted to do it every day. And, and, uh, and that is true to this day, as my wife would be, would be happy to tell you. Um, but, you know, even though I loved competing, you know, I never really aspired to be a professional. I never wanted to, to you know, not that I had the talent, but, but being a tour pro is not, what I, not ever what I had in mind. Um, I, always, I always wanted to be, by the time I started high school, I knew I wanted to be a sports writer. And, and specifically, I wanted to be a golf writer. So, um, having said that, I, I don't exactly know why I chose CMC uh, as, a, as a college. Um, I'm really glad I did. It, it's one of the best decisions I ever made. Um, I, got a, I got a great education. I had wonderful experiences, wonderful memories. I made lifelong friends. Um, it, was, it, was, it was really the right place for me, an extraordinary place for me personally. But for an aspiring sports writer, it was... Um, it was kind of an odd choice. It's not exactly a hotbed of, of sports writing training. I figured it out. You know, I, I, um, I spent a lot of time working for the sports information office in the athletic department. I, uh, I wrote sports and, and was the sports editor for the collage, which was the five college newspaper at the time. I became a, a stringer for the, for the Pomona city newspaper color, covering five college sports. Um, covered a lot of Pomona and CMC and Scripps athletic contests so that I wrote for the paper. It was a lot of fun. Um, but of course, given, even after all that, by the time I, I graduated in 1984, I didn't feel like I was ready to, that I had the experience to, to, to get out and, and begin a journal, journalism career. So as Mike said, I went to Northwestern University and got a master's degree at, uh, from the Medill School. Um, and that was, a, that was a nice experience. It wasn't as much fun at, at, as it was at CMC. I remember the first week I was there, you know, having one of these meetings where everybody was kind of talking about what they wanted, what their goal in journalism was. And I remember saying, I want to be a sports writer. And the, and the, and the guy who ran the program at Medill, who had been, a, been the editor in, at the Omaha World Herald said, you're not going to do any sports writing here. That's not real journalism. Um, so I, kind of got off to a rocky start there. But the best thing about, I did finish, and the best thing about Medill was that the three gentlemen who founded Golf Digest magazine in the 1950s, turns out they were Medill grads. And, and as late as 1985, when I was graduating, Golf Digest still did a little recruiting at, at Golf Digest for, for, for new employees. And it, it's kind of a long story, but I I wound up getting, an, getting a job at Golf Digest. And in 1986, I, I left uh, Los Angeles and my, and my favorite roommate of all time, Chris Brandt, and moved to Connecticut to start, you know, to start my journalism career. Um, I ended up staying at Golf Digest for 26 years. Um, the first two years I was at Golf Digest, um, but two years in the company bought a magazine called Golf World. And Golf World magazine was the perfect magazine for me. Um, Golf Digest is a magazine that's really based around instruction. And despite being a lifelong golfer, I'm not, I'm not very technical. And I don't, I can't write golf instruction. But Golf World magazine was a really interesting magazine. It was a weekly magazine devoted to covering competitive golf, primarily the PGA Tour. Um, it was I used to tell people, Two things, the golf world is like the golf magazine without golf instruction in it. And it was also kind of a Sports Illustrated, but just for, for golf. And so I went to work there and I began as a beat writer on the LPGA tour and a beat writer on the, on the senior tour, which is called the Champions Tour now. And I just had an amazing time. Um, some of the things I put in the bio there really happened. I was at Oakmont for the 1994 U.S. Open when, when Arnold Palmer played his final U.S. Open round and came into the press room when he was done. And Oakmont is, you know, in, in his backyard. Pennsylvania is his home state. And, and he gave a, a really amazing press conference for about 300 media members. Very, uh, 
you know, very bittersweet and, and dramatic. And, you know, by the end of an hour or so, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. It was pretty amazing. I was at uh, Newport Country Club in 1995 for the U.S. Amateur when Tiger Woods won, uh, won his second U.S. Amateur. It wasn't his first big win, but I think it was right about then that we all started to think, hey, this guy is really going to be something amazing. Um, I was at, and I was at Augusta two years later in 1997 when Tiger Woods won the Masters by 12 shots, and, and there was no doubt that he was something amazing. Um, I've, got to, I've got to cover the you know, Tiger's entire career. I've been there every step of the way for every amazing moment, every phenomenal golf shot, every huge, you know, win, and of course, all the other stuff that, that came with uh, covering Tiger Woods. Um, and that went on for 26 years. And for 15 of the first 15 years, we were owned, uh, my magazine was owned by the New York Times, which is an amazing journalism company. And, uh, and then the New York Times sold sold us to, to Condé Nast, which is an amazing magazine company. And I feel incredibly fortunate to have worked, to, to, you know, to have worked for two, two such um, you know, fantastic companies to, to get the kind of mentoring and the teaching and the experience and the opportunities that I got. It was really, uh, it was really wonderful. Um, in the mid nineties, I got married. Um, wouldn't normally talk about about my wife or my family, um, unless somebody asked, except that my wife plays a huge part in this story. She's a, she's a TV producer and she, she worked for um, NBC in the 90s and we met at a golf tournament that NBC was covering. And we got married, we have, um, you know, her TV producer career continued up, my magazine career continued on an, on an upward arc. Uh, we eventually, started a family. We have 17 year old triplets who uh, they turned 17 on on Sunday. So that's been a, a crazy ride. Um, but the reason I bring her up is that as you know, my 26 years at the magazine, the first 23 years, you know, were idyllic. It was a it was a wonderful place to work 45 weeks a year, we put out a magazine that was all about the week in golf, I used to go to work on Sunday mornings at about uh, 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock in the morning and I didn't come home until Monday night at nine o'clock when the magazine was done and, and had been shipped off to the printer to be printed and, and mailed and it was really a very rewarding busy but fun existence I you know I, if I was put on this world to do one thing it was edit that magazine and I, and I got to do it for a long time I, I eventually did become the editor um, but the last three years I was there, this thing called the internet uh, began to be a, have a huge impact on our business. Um, and as the internet came along, the print business started to suffer. I was not smart enough to, to really figure out how to make a magazine, how to, how to make our magazine deal with the internet. I think most of the people that I worked with weren't, weren't really um, prepared or, or able to figure out those questions as well. The last couple of years I spent, we used to spend about 50% of our time making magazines um, and about 50% of our time trying to figure out how to, how to make magazines that would work in the digital age. It's still, it's still something that not a lot of magazine companies have been able to figure out. The other, the other thing that impacted our business was that um, in 1995, Arnold Palmer of all people with, a, with some businessmen decided to, to start a a 24 hour cable uh, TV channel that was all about the, the game of golf. And it's, you maybe forget about it now because there's so many channels that cover sports, but in 1995, there were no uh, 24 hour, seven day a week cable, cable TV channels devoted to one sport. Golf Channel was the first channel to try and do that. And, and uh, you know, it got off to a slow start. There were some rocky times, but, but, um, but eventually, in about 2005, they, when they were 10 years old, they started doing pretty well, and they got the rights to the PGA Tour. And they became a formidable opponent for, for those of us in the golf magazine industry. But what happened to me was, through my wife and, and the years of being married to her, I got to know a lot of people at NBC, got to be friendly with them. Um, they were fans of the magazine, and when Comcast 
which owned the Golf Channel, bought NBC in about 2009. Um, they combined their sports assets, um, the NBC assets, NBC sports assets combined with, with the assets that Comcast had. And, and suddenly NBC was in charge of the Golf Channel and the people I knew at the Golf Channel uh, offered me a chance to go to work go to work there uh, in 2012. So I became the executive editor and my wife, Molly, um, became the executive producer. So for eight years, we've been down there together. Um, you know, I'm not a TV producer. My wife is a, is a TV producer. She's an amazing TV producer. I'm a, I'm a smart golf guy um, who knows journalism, knows editorial standards, knows, knows how to, how to, how to be an editor to a bunch of people who want to, who want to do great golf content. And so that's what I've, I've gotten to do the last eight years. Um, and that's kind of brings us to today. Um, the, I was telling Mike before we started the program that we are in the process of relocating the golf channel from Orlando after 25 years to go to Stanford, Connecticut, where NBC sports is headquartered. Um, that's a consolidation move. It's, uh, we got a big TV facility in Orlando, and we have a big TV facility in Stanford. We don't need we don't need two TV facilities, so we're gonna we're gonna move Golf Channel up there. I'm not gonna go. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna help our kids get out of high school. So at the end of this year, I'm gonna retire, and um, and call it a career after what I think almost 35, 36 years now, and figure out something else to do. But it's been a it's been a wonderful ride and um and i you know as i said maybe not what not what everybody else at, that i was in school with at cmc went off and did but but it 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 was exactly what i wanted to do and it's and it's worked out great so that's my story um you know i'd i'd love to i i mean i think this is probably the point where we open it up to questions and what do you think mike Yeah, it is my first Zoom. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so maybe uh, just a, a couple little insights in what's going on with the PGA right now with PGA Tour. Uh, sure. Folks might be interested in, in hearing about that. And then we can take some questions. If you want to put uh, questions in the chat, we can, or we can, uh, we can ask them. Uh, sure. You know, out so loud. Yeah. we've been very fortunate in the golf business because as all you golf fans out there know, Golf is, is maybe one sport out of, you know, NASCAR is another, and we're starting to play some soccer. But golf, golf they were able to get back up and running pretty quickly. You know, it's an outdoor sport. Um, you're only playing in professional golf. You're only playing with maybe two people at, at any – two other people at any one time. There's not a lot of chest bumping or tackling or, or rubbing up against each other. Um, they've been able to, for about – a month, month and a half now, play some tournaments. Been a few positive tests, but all in all, it's been a, it's been a pretty safe endeavor. Um, and you know, you don't, if you're watching golf on TV, you don't, you don't miss the fans. I don't think. What's one thing that we really worried about, and I think most sports are worried about, is how can you do, how can you do live sports without, without fans? Um, and I think as we've you know, as you, as you find when you watch TV, at least when you watch golf on TV, you, you don't notice, turns out you don't notice the fans as much as you think you do. Um, but we've been, we've been fortunate. We're, we're going to, um, for my friends in California, the PGA championship is supposed to be the first major of the year. It's scheduled for San Francisco this year in a couple of weeks. I know California is, um, is from a virus standpoint, maybe going in the wrong, dire wrong direction. We'll see if that happens, but hopefully, we have a PGA ch championship. We have a U.S. Open. We have a Masters this year, and and we and we get to keep showing golf. Jeff, we've got a, a few questions um, in the in the chat. I'm going to call on John McDowell first. John, thank yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, the question I had was just in general, what advice do you have for? Maybe current CMC students uh, who want to become journalists. I know we have some some uh, journalists at the New York Times, maybe the Washington Post, a couple other places, more politically oriented. But for right. CMCers who want to move into sort of the sports corporate world, 
uh, particularly journalism, what's the advice that you have, um, you know, for them and maybe just for us who maybe just, maybe, if, hey, I want a new career, so. Well, sure. Well, I, you know, I think, I think, John, a, a couple of things. I, Mike, Mike and, and the folks at CMC have been great the last couple of years. I get one or two perspective golf uh, journalism folks who come my way and, and, and I try to talk to them. I, I, think, I think a couple of things. It, it's easy to look at the world of, of traditional journalism right now and get discouraged, particularly if that's something you want to have a career in. But, but there's so much, there's so many new ways of doing journalism and non-traditional journalism. Um, and I, and I, think, I think it would be good for any particularly young folks starting out to, to think about those careers, whether it's, whether it's working for digital media, whether it's, whether it's you know, I, I was never very good with a camera, but if you can get good at filming and good at, at, and good at editing um, and, and doing that in addition to writing and editing, I think that's, um, there are great opportunities there. Um, I think a lot of, a lot of um, non-traditional places are doing, are doing journalism. You know, when I started, we covered, we covered professional golfers and we covered golf companies and we covered golf organizations like the USGA and the PGA Tour. And, and none of those, none of those areas did, you know, did their own journalism. We were the only ones who were writing stories and, and covering the PGA Tour. Now, you know, athletes all have their own websites. Athletes all have their own social media accounts. Um, golf equipment companies are really, are really big into creating content. They want to promote their products and they want to promote the players that endorse their products. The, um, you know, the one that's, that gets really painful for us sometimes is that the the PGA Tour has got a huge media operation. They do, they have, they've hired up a lot of old golf writers and a lot of old golf producers to do, to do golf content. And, and, you know, we, we butt heads all the time. It gets competitive, but, but it, you know, that's a huge change in, in 30 years of my being in the business is that I I think the important thing to remember is that content is always going to find an audience. You know, there's always going to be people out there who want content, who are interested in, in, you know, if you're a golf fan, you're going to want to read about Bryson DeChambeau putting on 35 pounds and, and gaining 50 yards on his, you know, in his game. And it's just a question of who's going to, where are you going to find that content? You probably, I hate to say it, you don't, you definitely don't buy Golf World Magazine anymore and you probably don't buy Golf Digest either, but you get that content from these other places. And that's, and that's what I think young aspiring journalists need to, need to remember. Yeah. yeah. We've got, uh, we got, let's see, we've got, um, uh, next up, Brad Pine has a question and Jeff Klein's on deck. Okay. Hey Jeff, uh, great to see you after all these years. Hi Brad, and, uh, you look great. It's great to see you. <laughs> As do you. Uh, yeah, it's, it's funny. I've actually, you know, Googled you intermittently to see what you're doing and, and envious of your success. Um, and you kind of touched on uh, my question, similar to what uh, John was asking, but do you think it's still relevant to go to journalism school in this world where it's, you know, internet and TV and, and you know, yes, we need content, but it doesn't seem like it works the same way. Brad, that's a great question and i and it it's a question i get i get all the time from from young folks and my answer this is you know I, this is kind of what i touched on in the beginning i journalism school is is definitely relevant but i would i would encourage anybody who's thinking about it any parents out there who are who are wondering about it for their kids i think it's a i think it's much better as an undergraduate experience than a graduate experience um, what i found what I found when it was time to go out and get a job in journalism, practical experience counted way more than a, than a degree did. I would never, you know, I would never discount my, my master's degree um, because it, it does count for a lot and it, and it was great experience and I did learn a lot. But, but at the end of the day, when you're, when you're trying to get a job in journalism, you have to show people, here's the stories I've written, here's the videos I've created, here's you know, here's, and, and, you know, the more of that that you can build up, 
um, that's what helps you get a job. And I think, you know, um, I, I think that it's just, you get, you, you know, in, in my experience, the journalism, the undergrad, you know, at Medill, there was a huge, there's obviously a huge undergraduate journalism community. And then there was the graduate school and the undergrads <clears throat> seem to be getting a better, you know, getting more out of it than we did. They were there for four years. They were, um, you know, they were, it was part of their schooling, it was part of their education. I, you know, if I, as much as I loved CMC, I think if, if I had it to do over again, now, if, you know, if one of my kids comes to me and, and is hell bent on a journalism career like I was then, I would steer him to a school that, that offers a journalism program as an, as an undergraduate degree. But I, but yeah, I, I still think it's great. It's great training. It's wonderful training. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Jeff Klein. Jeff, where are you, buddy? Uh, there he is. You mentioned it a little bit in your previous remarks about the impact of social media, but I'd love to get your sense of how social media has changed golf journalism. It certainly has had a powerful impact on traditional current event journalism as journalists have tried to develop their own brands with their Twitter feeds and the level of sort of vitriolic and angry back and forth on Twitter and other, other social media platforms. Has that happened in the world of golf journalism? And what's your opinion of that? I, I think it's happened a little bit uh, in golf journalism. Maybe, you know, maybe not to the extent as it has in other sports, but I would say that's just a factor. Golf is not as big a sport as NBA basketball or NFL football or some of the other, some of the other sports. Um, I, I think it's impacted in, in a number of ways. One, you, you know, you put news out on social media and that's the quickest way to disseminate news that there is, you know, a newspaper can't beat that a weekly, a weekly magazine can't beat that a TV network can't beat that. You know, the minute, the minute Tiger Woods announces he's playing in, in a golf tournament and, and commits to a tournament, um, you know, that's, that's on Twitter and, Instagram in five minutes. And, and so breaking news becomes almost impossible to do for a traditional journalist. And you're taught breaking news is kind of your number one, your number one goal. The other, another way that it affects, and, and you kind of mentioned, you know, journalists are out there trying to create their own brand and you can do that. But a more serious issue for journalists is that the athletes are trying to create their own brand. And, you know, the history of, the history of journalism involves, you know, a, you know, tension between, you know, kind of a, a professional tension between the, between the writer, you know, the journalist and the subject, right? And, and no matter how conscientious of a journalist you are, it's inevitable that you're going to, you're going to write stories that your subjects aren't going to like. Um, you know, they're not going to like your take. They're not going to like your poking into their background. You're not going to like the, they're not going to like some of the things that you reveal about them. Um, but that always kind of came with the territory. And when I started as a, as a journalist, it was easy to get, not easy, but I mean, the, the, the natural byplay was that the athletes would talk to people like me. You know, you could, you could have interviews and, and it was part of the research process. That interview with the, with the player that you were, the golfer you were writing about was a, was a huge, you know, was a huge part of the process. I think athletes have learned that they don't have to do that anymore. They can bypass, they can, they really want to get their message out in the form that they want it, that they want it out. They don't need to talk to journalists anymore. They can just do it themselves. And the ones who are really, really good at it, like Ricky Fowler and, you know, Bubba Watson for a long time, um, you know, Phil Mickelson in the last year has become a real big star on social media. Um, you know, it's, it, 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 it's not ending journalism as we know it, but it, it really, we, people like me have to get used to the idea that Phil Mickelson's not going to talk to us, or, you know, certainly Tiger Woods is not going to talk to us. They don't, they don't feel like they need to. And you have to learn to do journalism in a, you know, in a different way. You have to learn how to write a story about Phil, Phil Mickelson without ever talking to Phil Mickelson, which, you know, is, is delicate and complicated and, and, 
and, um, and makes you have to work harder. The last thing I think I would say about social media and the way it's, it's impacted our business is that social media, and it's kind of related to the point I just made, when you, when you don't have a lot of concrete information from talking to Phil Mickelson, it's easy to formulate opinions about Phil Mickelson that, that you, that you, you know, that, that, that are easy to not make up, but, but you take liberties, right? And, and that, you know, one of the things that the communication between the journalist and the, and the athlete or the journalist and the subject did, it, it kind of kept the journalist honest, you know? We used to say, if you write a, a, a critical story of somebody, I'd, you know, I had a boss once who said, you write a critical story about somebody, I want you out at the next tournament next week so they can find you if they're unhappy and you guys can have a conversation about it because the subject deserves that, you know, deserves the chance to, to get in your face and, and, and have it out with you. Um, I think with social media, that that doesn't happen as much anymore. It, it, it's easier for journalists to, to, to say things that are overly critical, overly nasty, um, and, and, and then not really face accountability afterwards. Um, yeah, so I, I, think, those- I think that um, people say things on social media that they, to another person that they would never say in person to that other person. Correct. Absolutely. Thank you. By the, by the way, went to J school with Mike Ritz. So if he hasn't retired from the golf channel yet, please say hello to him for me. I sure will. He's, uh, he's still around and, and I don't, I don't see him in, in the, in the age of COVID, but we email a little bit and I'll tell him, I'll tell him you said hi. Thank you. Nice. Thanks, Jeff. Hey, Sam Minter has a question for you, Jeff. Yeah. Hi, thanks for uh, taking the time today. This may be a somewhat inside baseball, but I'm the kind of degenerate fan that um, has PGA Tour Live, for example, follows all the tournaments, is looking at the betting matchups. There's no need to get me into golf. Um, uh-huh. But this past week, you saw on Sunday, three of the best guys in the final group, the Young Guns, um, and they, it wasn't on TV. Um, people were, my friends were texting me saying, how do I watch this? Is it the only live sport on now? Um, there's this constant attention on grow the game, but... Um, there seems to be especially this disconnect with the CBS Lance Barrow contract and getting the game for um, the masses, especially at a time like this. So how do you think that can be better addressed? Because again, I I don't need to be um, bought for the game, but there's a lot that needs to be done for other people. Like even my parents who were confused this weekend when it wasn't on TV on Sunday. So Sam, I feel your pain. I think everybody at the golf channel feels your pain. Um, Whenever this had, for those of you who are wondering what happened, um, this weekend CBS had the broadcast rights to the to the PGA Tour event, and it was being played in in Ohio. And going into the final round, the weather forecast was was lousy, and the it was going to rain and thunderstorm in the afternoon. And probably if they went with normal starting times, the tournament wasn't going to finish before sunset on Sunday. So the tour made the decision to move the tee times up up. and, and, and have everybody play early so that they could finish before the rain started, the rain and the thunderstorms. The issue is that CBS owns the rights to, to show the final round. And when CBS has the, has the rights, they want to show the golf in the window that they are committed to, they are not prepared to start the go- the coverage of the golf early. Bring all their production people in, and start probably in this case five hours early and show the golf. And they may not be prepared to do it, and they may also not want to do it because they're going to get a higher rating from, you know, from three to six Eastern time than they would from ten a.m. to to one p.m. Eastern time. Um, you know, in this day and age, when when everybody expects everything to be live and and probably has a right to expect things to be live, that that that's a, that is a problem um, because what we've been talking about here for 20 minutes is by the time but by the time CBS is showing the golf tournament on on tape, everybody's been learning about it on the internet, knows knows who won, knows what the outcome was, and 
and now maybe they're not going to watch it. Um, so that Sam, in this case, I think that was a that was a CBS uh, decision, and I th I think at our company uh, at Golf Channel, and you know we're we're connected with NBC. I think we've come around on that, and we we also have Golf Channel as a as a nice landing spot. CBS CBS. CBS and Golf Channel work together, but we're not business partners. And so they don't want to let us have, have the final round and, and show it on the Golf Channel and get all the, you know, get all the revenue from it. Whereas if it was an NBC tournament and it was starting five hours early, I think we've become pretty good at putting it, you know, putting it on Golf Channel and showing it live. So at least you and your parents can, can watch it in real time. Appreciate I'm gonna, it. Thank you. I'm going to be out of the business before I can fix that one. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Thanks. Hey, we've got Mark Risman up next and uh, Kyle Casella on deck. Hey, Jeffrey, thank you so much. Uh, I'm just glad Marty Hackle isn't on to criticize all our apparel in this. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, he, he would, wouldn't like what I'm wearing today. Yeah, no yeah. bright greens or pink pants with him. But yep. um, two quick questions. Do you think pro-ams will come back before general fans are let into the tournaments? And then secondly, do you think Lee Elder, Lee Elder will have the opportunity to be an honorary starter with Nicholas and player this year at the masters? So uh, let's see the first question. I think, you know, I think pro-ams. Yes. I think pro-ams will probably come back before before the fans do just because it's a it's kind of a um it's a numbers game right and 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 there are there are a lot more fans than there are pro-am pro-am participants um interesting thing about pro-ams and and professional golf you know you're watching you're watching a lot of pga tour right now but but the lpga tour and the european tour and some of these other tours haven't had a chance to come back yet and i think part of the reason for that is that the PGA Tour's TV contract uh, with us and CBS and the other networks is so large that the money that they get every week, uh, their, their portion of the rights deal is so large that they can actually afford to have a tournament without fans and without, without a program and without all the, the other money-making ways that, that, um, that, that, tournaments, you know, that tournaments have to make money. It's not the same with with like the LPGA and the European Tour. The LPGA Tour needs that their TV rights deal isn't anywhere near as large as the PGA Tours. And and for you know for for little tournaments in places like Grand Rapids, you you and and Toledo and and the places where the LPGA plays, they need the pro ams. They need to sell tickets. They need to sell hot dogs and and have people park their cars. Otherwise, those tournaments don't make money. So. Um, the virus is really having uh, a big effect there. Um, Lee Elder, uh, you know, that's a great, that's a great question. I, I can't, you know, of all the organizations that I've covered over the years, I would say Augusta National is the most uh, impervious to outside opinion and, and being pushed into doing anything they don't feel like doing. Um, it took them, as we all know, a long time before they had uh, a diverse membership before they had black members uh, took them even longer to get female members um, but but I think this is a this is a different day and age we're living in and maybe and maybe different you know maybe different people running the masters and i wouldn't i wouldn't um, i wouldn't count it out um, but they might be more they might be more inclined to wait for someone like VJ Singh or, or Tiger Woods, uh, you know, some past champion of color to, uh, to add to that lineup. But that is a hundred percent a guess. I don't, uh, I don't know. And the only person who does know is Fred Ridley, and he's the guy who runs the Masters. Thanks, Mark. Kyle. Thanks for joining us, Jeff. Um, the PGA Tour seems to be very restrictive with their content and how they, you know, we're talking about Instagram and social media earlier and how they let um, non-licensed uh, creators utilize content to, um, what I would say, promote the game. Right. Give a view on, 
on if you think that's the right path or if you think they'll do something differently in the in the future. Um, it seems like other leagues are moving in different directions. You know, I think um, I believe that I, I've always been of the belief that you know the more you share your content, the the better it is for your product, the better it is for your brand. But that's you know that's not my you know that's not my um, that's not my specialty. You know, in my profession for years, all of our, you know, newspapers and magazines, we all gave away our content for free on the internet. And, and now we're, a lot of them are out of business. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure giving away content really worked for them. The PGA Tour, and I was never, I was never part of a company that was in business with the PGA Tour until I went to work for, for the Golf Channel. And we have been the golf, you know, golf channel has been the PGA tours, uh, cable television partner for 15 years now. And I think at the beginning of the contract, I wasn't there then, but at the beginning of the contract, you know, digital rights, um, you know, video highlights, all that stuff was kind of a small potatoes. It's become a, a it's become a huge deal. And at the golf channel, we don't have, we don't have, great video rights. You know, we are not allowed to, um, you know, on our social media handles, put out highlights from PGA Tour events of stuff we're showing on our own air. We, um, this would be really getting in the weeds, but if you ever wonder why our Golf Central News Show, why we don't, why we don't post uh, segments from our show on our website, you know, if Randall Chambly says something crazy during a video package why we you know that everyone's talking about why we don't put that online it's because we don't we don't have the right to because of our contract with the pga tour um you know obviously what that tells me is that those those digital rights and, own, and owning the right you know owning having exclusivity over your content is a is a really big you know is a really big deal I, i'm not i'm not sure how much longer we're all going to be watching golf on on television sets you know I think I think um, you know certainly my kids my kids don't watch TV you know they don't watch sports on TV they watch it on phones and iPads and their computers and other devices and and I think places like the PGA Tour want to control that they don't want to give it to just anybody who wants it um, at the end of the day I don't think they see the benefits to to growing the game if it means they're gonna lose those rights it's not a good business deal Yeah. Okay. Um, Al Hartunian. Al Hartunian yeah, followed uh, by Andrew Gordon. Andy. Do you think that the Tiger Woods scandal caused any lasting damage to the PGA Tour? Um, in the end, in the end, probably not. You know, um, I think I think everybody's got to, you got to begin by understanding what a gigantic presence and a gigantic star Tiger Woods is for the PGA Tour and for all of golf, really. When we, when, when we show an event with Tiger Woods in it, um, it's going to double and probably triple the ratings of an event that doesn't have Tiger, Tiger Woods in it. So... Tiger Woods, as we used to say, Tiger Woods doesn't move the needle. Tiger Woods is the needle. And when the scandal happened, um, it was obviously bad. It was obviously bad for Tiger. And then after the scandal, if you remember, he came back, you know, he came back and he started playing and he was kind of lousy for a while and sort of unenthusiastic. And then he, then he had a couple of, of really successful years. He didn't win any majors, but he had a year where he won five tournaments and he, and he seemed to be coming back and then he and then he got hurt and then he had back problems and and he had a series of operations and and he really wasn't um he really wasn't a factor and at that point i can tell you that the the, that the tv business was in terms of covering professional golf the ratings were were really in a bad place and um and for those of those of us in the TV business, it was kind of a double-edged sword. Like you want great TV ratings because that's the key to your revenue. But as we were getting ready to negotiate a new rights deal with the PGA Tour, 
low ratings are actually a good thing because now we're not going to have to pay as much money for those rights as we as we thought we were. Um, you know, I love Jordan Spieth and Justin Thomas and and um, and Rory McIlroy. They're they're fantastic, um, but they don't get an audience the way Tiger Woods does. And so as we were getting ready into negotiating this new TV rights deal, lo and behold, Tiger Woods starts winning again. And, and all he has to do is win a tour championship and win a Masters, and suddenly the audience comes back. And, and so the tour was, last year we, we, uh, we started negotiating a new, a new rights deal, which we signed uh, in March of this year, and the tour did just fine. Um, they got a huge pay increase. So in the end, no, I don't think that, I don't think the scandal hurt the PGA tour because, because Tiger Woods is still their biggest star <laughs> all these years later. Yeah. Yeah. Next up, Andy. Oh, give him the Andy. Money. We can't hear you, Andy. Not only, not only do I not know how to operate these things, I'm also apparently the only one stupid enough on this call not to figure out how to get a job where I'm not wearing a tie. So I apologize for my. <laughs> Hello, outfit. Your Honor. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna dredge up the age-old question of why we have to be quiet in golf. I mean, I, I know baseball players have the argument we can hit a ball coming at 110 miles an hour with a bat. Uh, setting aside that golf is a genteel and formal sport, yep. you're talking about attracting the crowd, going to the audience, and it seems like the audience, younger folks these yeah. days, tend to be a little more rowdy, a little less formal. When fans start coming back, um, is there ever going to be a time when golf starts to relax and let people be a little noisy, other than the 16th hole at the Phoenix Open, which is a big crowd right. draw. And or the Ryder Cup. Crazy. Or the Ryder Cup too, but they, they're still a little quiet. Yeah. yeah. So, so is that ever going to change? Are people going to be allowed to get noisy at a golf tournament? You know, that's a that's a great question. I I think it. I don't know. You know, I I think there. I I just think I think it's ingrained. I mean, look, I I think golf's gotten noisier. Um, I, one of the things I started doing about five years ago is I started listening to music when I play golf. You know, they have these portable speakers now and, and a lot of golfers, a lot of recreational golfers love to get these speakers and I hang one on my golf bag now and I find that, you know, you can play it real low so you're the only one who can hear it. You can play it really loud so everybody in your group can hear it. And, and I really enjoy it. It calms me down. It, 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 you know, it kind of fills the fills the dead space, um, and it's noise, right? It's not screaming and yelling, but it, but it's more noise than I'm used to. I I think that. You know, I think they're always going to be. It, what it comes down to is, does it? You know, are professional golfers disturbed by, by having you know crowd behavior, and, and some of them still are, and as long as they can, as long as they can complain about it, and 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 have have fans tossed out for, you know, for, for, for behavior that they think crosses the line or prevents them from, from doing their job, um, then it'll be hard, it'll be hard to change that one. But, but I, there's a, you know, it, your, your larger point about getting, about getting new fans and younger fans, you, know, you just got to look, you know, for a long time, pro golf didn't want cell phones at their, at their, uh, tournaments and now now you know they've relaxed all those rules and and to you know one of the earlier points it, that is that is a way that they that they allow people to share their their content is you can go to a tournament and take cell phone video and put it out you know put it out on the internet and they're and they're fine with that um, the one place where one place where that hasn't that rule hasn't changed is the masters and if they catch you on the grounds at Augusta National with a phone they'll throw you out and they'll never, they'll never let you back. Um, it's weird. Um, it's like the one place left in, in the world where you can't have a cell phone. Um, and they don't seem like they're ready to change anytime soon. It's good to see you, Andy. You look great. You, you too. Thanks. <laughs> That's great. Uh, let's see who's up next. Paul Fisher has a question for you, Jeff.
Did we lose him, Paul? Paul was asking about podcasts. Paul, can you? Okay. Uh, there right. he is. There he is. Yeah. Good. There he is. Sorry about that. Um, that is a journalism, golf journalism, sports journalism question. Uh, podcasts are becoming more and more burgeoning out yeah. there, and I was wondering how they're affecting the business. And um, seems to me there's some uh, the, the spectrum uh, that covers golf is out there. there some of them they're really trash and some of them are really good, but yeah. just wondering how they were affecting things. So I'll answer that question this way, Paul. I, um, I've had to get really smart about podcasts pretty quickly because podcast, you're right there. It's kind of exploding and, and it's, it's like we say, it's the wild, wild west out there. But I, in my role at the golf channel, overseeing all these, you know, people who make content, all the TV people and all the website people and all the, the digital people, that was the kind of the number one thing that everybody pitched me was I want to start my own golf podcast. And I think, I think it's just because you can't, if you're in our business, you can't start your own golf TV show. It's too complicated or you can't, you can't, you know, go write a book or columns, you know, writing's a lot of work, but I think everybody wanted to do a podcast. And, and the first few times I was very accommodating. I said, sure, if you want to start a podcast, go for it. We have a podcast department over here and, and they'll help you. They'll help you get started. Pretty soon our podcast department was overwhelmed. And to your point, I think, I think most of the podcasts weren't very good. Um, and I had to try to figure out why that, why was that the case? And I realized the first thing you got to do is if you want to, you got to, you got to go and find out what you like in podcasts. I was telling people they could do podcasts and I didn't, personally listen to a lot of podcasts. So I started doing that. And I think, you know, I think the best podcast, number one, it, you know, shorter is better. Um, we do podcasts at the golf channel. And sometimes these episodes go longer than an, than an hour, you know, nobody's got an hour to listen to a podcast. I think a podcast is something you do when you're driving your kids to school or you're driving to work in the morning or you're walking your dog in the morning. So a podcast, good podcast episode needs to be like, 20, 25 minutes tops. I also think everybody who wanted to do a podcast at the Golf Channel, their idea was to go out and interview people. And they were all trying to get the same guests. Everybody wanted to interview Jack Nicholas, and everybody wanted to interview, you know, Tiger Woods, and everybody wanted to interview Justin Thomas. And maybe I'm jaded, but I hear those people all the time. And I, I don't, uh, uh, you know, it just, I don't, you know, I didn't, I, and I think if you're a golf fan, you've heard Jack Nick, you hear Jack Nicholas talk all the time. I think the best podcasts are podcasts that tell a story. You know, it's just like a magazine piece. It's just like a, like a, like an episode of a TV show. There has to be, you know, there has to be a message there. There has to be a story arc there, you know, unless you're a really, really good interviewer like Conan O'Brien or Howard Stern, um, an, a, an interview podcast, I think, is hard to pull off. So I've tried to coach our folks to, um, you know, to try to, to try to design your podcast like you would, a, you know, a magazine piece or a, or a TV series. You know, we have people, I work with a guy named Jaime Diaz, and Jaime's been covering Tiger Woods his whole career. I mean, he's the smartest journalist there's ever been when it comes to Tiger Woods. And I said, mm -hmm. you should do a Six, six episode pod podcast on covering Tiger Woods and and what it's been like that would be really fascinating but I think I think podcasts it's not as simple as just saying I'm gonna start a podcast I'm gonna get a tape recorder I'm gonna turn it on and I'm gonna interview somebody over the phone it's not that easy no. I think That's Jeff I think. we've got a we have a young alum out here Skylar Butts is is watching in today he's a He's a tennis alum from a couple of years back, a national champ, and he started a, a, a neat podcast, uh, D3 to Pro. I'd love to have you two guys connect later. Yeah. And have a chat with this guy. We've got That's another question up. Andrew Stroud is, uh, is in the house. Andrew? Yeah, Hi, go. Jeff. How are you? Hi, Andy. How are you, buddy? I'm doing very fine. Thank you. You look Shelley fantastic. Says, yeah, Shelly, thank you. Shelly says hello as, uh, hello as well. You, 
you tell Shelly, I think Dan DeBevick left, so you tell Shelly she was the best RA of all time. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will tell her that. I don't right. tell that. Listen, I think that also when Andrew Gordon asked his question, you should have asked him, when is he going to let people yell at him while he does his job, you know? <laughs> then then we'd be living. <laughs> I, his job is a lot more important than, than those of us who, who, who hang out at golf courses for a living. But anyway. Um, hey, I have, uh, Shelly and I have two sons, Jeff, and I, we've been trying like heck, I have at least to get them involved in golf, yep. uh, uh, bought them golf clubs, uh, lessons, all sorts of stuff. And, uh, you know, oh, it takes too much time. It's too long, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts and what that about how to get young people involved and what that means for the future of the game. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I, Another great question. I've kind of been through that in my own house. Um, <laughs> I've got, I've got three 17 year olds. I have a son and two daughters. My son, by far the biggest sports nut um, of, of all of them. And he's played soccer and he's played basketball and he's played this and he's played that. And I really never really succeeded in getting him into golf. I, I wasn't heavy handed about it, but I spent a lot of time trying to figure out you know, why, what his issue was with golf. And I think, you know, I watched him play soccer for nine years and <laughs> he, you know, he would go to practice four days a week and he would, you know, the guys on the kids on his soccer team were his, you know, 12 best friends in the world. And he had a coach who, 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 you know, really was a pretty, you know, tough on him and, and, and held him to, you know, high standards and accountability and made him, you know, and, and, you know, disciplined him when he, when he, when he didn't do the right thing or didn't do what he was told to do. And then at the end of the, you know, at the end of the week, he, uh, we got to the weekend and now there's a game and he gets to put on a uniform and he gets to go and be with those 12 guys and play a, you know, go somewhere and play against another team. And, and the whole thing was incredibly rewarding for him. And golf doesn't provide any of that, you know, golf, you don't, you're not on a team. You, uh, you know, it's a very solitary pursuit. You're not on a team and you're not, you don't get to wear a uniform and there isn't a, you know, you know, you, at the end of the week, you don't, you don't go have a, you, you don't have a golf competition against another team full of golfers, you know, it's, and I think that's, that was certainly an issue for him. And I think it was an issue for a lot of young athletes. And I think golf is trying to, trying to figure that out. The PGA of America has got something called the junior league, which is a, which is a, 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 a team aspect. It's, 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 um, I don't know. I think you're in Sacramento. Are you still in Sacramento? You bet. Um, you know, Hagen Oaks out there is a, is one of the best public golf facilities in the country. And, and they, they do all of this stuff. And, um, if you were, if it's not too late, I would try to, I, I really think that that, that that camaraderie is, is the first thing kids notice about golf that lack of camaraderie that you're not that you're not with uh, usually with a bunch of other kids your own age who are pursuing the same way you are um you know as it turned out I have a daughter who who isn't who is is got decent athletic skills but doesn't you know it's not really competitive by nature and doesn't really want to perform in front of a bunch of other people she's kind of gotten into golf because it's <laughs> cerebral and it's and it's kind of a mental challenge and and she she enjoys it a little bit more than my son does but but I think that's and the last thing you've got to recognize it's incredibly frustrating um, it's a hard game to learn and and it does take uh, practice and and it does take time um, and you know don't make them play 18 holes. Let them, you know, you know, find a place that lets you play three holes or four holes or nine holes at a time. That might help too. So. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Jeff. That's great, Jeff. Hey, we are right at the top of the hour here. There's one question in the waiting room. Jeff, you got time for another question? I do. Sure. Good. And so for the folks that uh, that were able to come in today, you're welcome, welcome to stay, but just let know that we are, like I said, we're at that, uh, at that point. Uh, we'll be wrapping up shortly. And it's been great to have everybody in today. Tomorrow, uh, we do it again. And uh, the, the real host will be back. But 
Uh, this has been terrific, Jeff. I'm going to thank you right now, but uh, let's let's see what Terrell Jones has for you here. Maybe this will be the showstopper. I don't know. There you go. Showstopper. <laughs> hey, Terrell, are you there? There he is. We can't hear you, though, buddy. Yeah, you're unmuted. It looks like you're unmuted, but we're missing you, darn it. Oh, man. Let me try this. I switched. There the you go. Got okay. you now. I yeah. switched microphones. So I'm sorry about that. Um, and then my apologies for tuning in late. Um, uh, I just had a bunch of uh, errands that ran longer than I thought. Um, okay. But um, uh, uh, by the way, I, I teach journalism here, uh, here at CMC. I wonder if you ever came across a golf writer named Tommy Bonk. I sure did. Yeah, Tommy. Tommy, <laughs> Tommy was a, you know, a, a great colleague of mine when he was at the Los Angeles Times, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and a, and you know, a little bit of a mentor to me. Great guy. You know, okay. great, great writer. Yeah. yeah he's, he he sat in the cubicle next to me when I was assigned to uh, uh, San Francisco. <laughs> but my, que my question is, um, you know, and forgive me if someone has asked this, uh, but uh, U.S. presidents uh, are frequently associated with with golf. Yeah, uh, whether people complain that they play golf too much or that they don't play golf and so they they don't and so and then that's come up as an issue under Barack Obama as a president under Donald Trump as a president. I just wonder since you've been doing this for so long, what what kind of sense do you have of the influence of a US president on the game of golf? You know, can that bring more people um, into the sport or does it turn some people off? You know, I, I don't think it can hurt. Um, I think anytime the you know, the leader of the free world is, you know, is interested in something, um, you know, you, I mean, every, you know, every, every move they make is, is covered by a huge press corps. And so when, um, you know, when, when the first George Bush played golf, people were covering it. Um, the second George Bush, the, you know, Bill Clinton loved to play golf. Uh, you know, it's, it's constantly on TV. I, Funny story. I there was a there was a, a speaking of pro ams at the Bob Hope Classic one year in Palm Springs um, when Bill Clinton had become president. They had a day where Gerald Ford and and the first George Bush Bush and Bill Clinton were paired together for the pro am, and it was the first time three presidents ever played golf together. And I got I was part of the press pool that got to that got to cover that. Um, you weren't the fourth. It, I'm sorry. You weren't the fourth. Uh, I was not the fourth. Uh, the fourth <laughs> was Bob Hope, uh, which is probably a better choice. Um, and Scott Hoke, who was the defending champion of the tournament. They actually played five. But, you know, I think the thing, so so it's good for golf, but the but the kind of, you know, sort of the negative thing about it, if, if it is negative, is that is that the presidents who play golf are always a little embarrassed to be playing golf. It's as though all that time they spend you know, playing golf and is taking away from the business of the nation. And, and I, I definitely remember that when George W. Bush, when the desert or, you know, when the, um, when the uh, Iraq war started, um, he made a point of, of, you know, he stopped playing golf because he just felt that, that it was um, the critici criticism that came from, you know, from playing golf when there was a war going on was, was just not worth you know, was not worth the, worth it to him. And so he stopped. And I, you know, look, I always felt like that was kind of sad. I, I think golf is a great, is a great thing. It's a great exercise. It's great for the mind too. And I, I don't, I, you know, I think when I see any, anyone playing golf, even a president, I think that's four good hours of thinking and, and mind clearing and, and relaxation. And, you know, sometimes you get done with a round of golf and you've, you've figured out, how to solve a few problems, but it's tough for presidents. I get it. So I, I think that might be a wrap. Um, unless Brian, unless you want to share something with us, Brian Toy, you've been a, a key contributor in the yeah. chat today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, Brian. Uh, let's see. Can you hear me? Uh, I I, I'm on the phone. Okay. Yep, you can hear me. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. My internet's not very good. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, I'm just uh, a little, uh, 
frustration with uh, golf and, and politics and and uh, and getting people into golf, and I'm uh, not really into golf. Uh, I've watched golf with my dad, but I, I I've just been on the on the driving range, and I've uh, been on to my uh, uh, local expensive uh, uh, country club in Los Gatos, and you know it's expensive even in pricey Silicon Valley, right. um, and just wondering. Uh, how we can uh, how we can bring golf to uh, to the masses so that uh, that uh, uh, I'm struggling to make the connection here between golf and how we can golf can be a, a tool to uh, to uh, help us go along better politically and and uh, and between uh, 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 you know. In the, Let's face it, like, uh, uh, like uh, when you're young, you want things to do and you want to, uh, to uh, do well in school so you can get a, a job and so you can marry and, and, and date. And uh, Jenna knows that this is a topic of mine that's come up again and again. <laughs> so apologies to Jenna. But, uh, you know, they, they want to, to, to do work and to date. In, in, uh, you're preparing kids to do that when they're young and then, when you get old, that's what you want to do too. You want to have uh, a wife that's happy, or you want to be dating to get a wife that's happy. And and so, you no, know, uh, you know, I, I think uh, this is a philosophical question that I learned from Paul Hurley at who's uh, was at Pomona and now is at CMC. You know, how can we uh, how can we bring these things together? Golf and politics and getting a job and finding someone to uh, to uh, that we a partner that we want to be with. So there's a lot there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what I would, you know, I, I mean, I hard for me to, to speak to anybody's experience, but my own experience, you know, what I could tell you is that I grew up in Sacramento, um, you know, single mom, one of two kids and kind of a nerd, you know, and obviously, as I've yeah. said, I gravitated towards golf and, um, I played public golf. Um, golf was a really good socializing force for me. You know, as a, I'm not sure this happens anymore, but as a 13, 14, 15 year old, I used to go to the public courses in Sacramento by myself and sign up to play. And I would just get matched with, you know, with three other people who I didn't know. And most of the time they were, they were, adults who were older than me most of the time um you know most of the time they were men but it you know it forced me to to learn to interact with people and and to get over my shyness get over whatever kind of you know issues i had and in, in you know in terms of making friends and becoming outgoing I, and and then and then later on i got a job at at a at a very nice private club in in sacramento and and that introduced me to people like you know, federal judges and successful businessmen and TV executives and, yeah. and um, you know, doctors and lawyers and all these people. And, it, and I think that was a, you know, that opened my eyes to what, you know, what the possibilities were in terms of getting an education and, and getting a career. And, and listen, I met my wife. Uh, I met my wife at a golf tournament. Um, she was working for NBC and I was, and I was working for the magazine. But as it turned out, she loved to play golf. She was a more of a beginner, but, but we, you know, about our first 15 dates were, were playing golf together. And, uh, oh. and by the 16th date we were engaged. And to this day, <laughs> you know, 25 years later, playing golf together is still, is still the best thing for us to do together. The, you know, the, the, the thing that is, is her favorite. So I, I can only speak for myself. Golf seems to be this, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's been great for me. It's been great for my life. It's been great for my career. It's been great for my family and my happiness. Um, I don't know what to do yeah. about politics. That's outside of my, um, <laughs> yeah. outside of my uh, comfort zone. Um, you know, you would like to think that, that, um, you know, if you, if you, I mean, I remember Barack Obama playing golf with, with John Boehner, when he was the speaker of the house okay. and, and it was a, it was maybe the only thing they ever did together, but they, but they did play 18 holes together and they seemed to have fun. And, 
and who knows, maybe it Im improved their relationship, but, but we are, it's a little more complicated times yeah. these days, but yeah. that's what I think about golf and growing the game. Okay. Amen. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff, thank you so much. What a, what a great chat today. And, uh, great to see so many of your friends and compadres from over the years here. And, uh, yep, it sure has been. Day today. Thank you for, for making the time to be with us and, uh, well, we'll wish you. everybody a great rest of the day, great week, and look forward to seeing you on Zoom down the line here, okay? Thank, thank you yeah. for inviting me. It's Jeff, we'll check back with you here in just a sec, okay? okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Adios for now, everybody.